Welcome back, everyone, to the Dark Forest. Tonight's tale is a little different, but still totally cryptified. Have any of you ever went swimming or boating or even fishing at a lake? I have not. I've been to the beach a million times. Hell, I was a sailor. Navy. USS Nimitz represent. But there is something terribly eerie about a lake at night. Let's get spooky. The trip to the lake was just meant for a bunch of us college kids to blow off some steam. I'm still unsure of what I saw that night, and they also haven't found any trace of Kevin. I had a paper due next week, a big one that would bring my grade down if I half-assed it. I was doing a lot of half-assing recently, and wanted to get myself a bit more on track. Then my roommate invited me for a weekend trip to the lake. I really should use those two days for doing homework I was putting off, but he begged and begged. He wanted to make more friends and gotten as far to being invited to a lake trip. He was so nervous being around new people, he asked me to go around for moral support. I relentedly agreed and stayed one day instead of the whole weekend. I drove us down to the lake to meet everyone. To my surprise, I saw Kevin in with a small group of people. His sister was in my college group, so Kevin tagged along. I felt sorry for her, for not only having him as a brother, but not being able to keep him away from her friends. Kevin was... special. We called him a lovable village idiot because most of the times he was just an idiot. When he saw me, he threw his hands up in the air with a yell that startled everyone. If I didn't dodge him, he would have chest bumped me to the ground. Kevin was very physical when excited. Jim, my roommate, felt better knowing someone like Kevin would take all the attention off of him in case he did something embarrassing in front of the new group of friends. We all got friendly introductions. Natalie was single and friends with Kevin's sister Lizzie. Barb and Cody were a couple. Jack and Ian were also a couple. Kevin made some very inappropriate jokes towards them. Nothing hateful, just something Kevin would be dumb enough to say. I don't know how they tolerated him. If I was in their shoes, I would have had him packing, and I sort of liked the guy. Everything was already set up by the time we arrived. They found a good area right beside the lake. Small waves lapped over the sandy shore. A cool wind blew, making it a perfect spot. I brought some food to grill, and a lot of marshmallows for later. At first, Jim stayed glued to my side, too shy to start up a conversation. I got him talking with Jack and Ian after I overheard they both played D&D. In the next few minutes, all three talked as if they had known each other for years. A fire got started, so we all found a spot to sit after dinner was made, eaten and cleaned up. The beer cooler came out once everyone was comfortable by the fire. Everyone had partnered up and I got Kevin duty. As it grew dark and the conversation started to get louder, I had to keep an eye out on my old dumb high school buddy. He tried to put a closed can of beer in the fire to see if it would explode. When I took that away from him, he started flicking half-burnt marshmallows around trying to see if they would stick to things. One nearly took out poor Jack's eye. Kevin lost his marshmallow privileges. By nine, he was getting antsy trying to think of other ways to get attention. I'm gonna go prank the girls. I'm gonna start recording in like 10 minutes, maybe 20, but I gotta go take a dump in the woods. Kevin whispered over, almost right in my ear. I didn't need to hear the second part, dude. I told him, but Kevin was already gone. Depending on what he considered a prank, I might need to kick his ass in a few minutes. I was the only one not drinking. My plan was to leave at midnight. The lake wasn't very far away from our college, so it made it a great spot for parties. I could get back home at 2am and I normally stayed up that late on weekends anyways. Besides not wanting to drive home after drinking, I had never liked drinking to start with. Since Jim was having a good time, I knew it was safe to book it. Having one sober person sometimes brings down the party. Plus, I trusted everyone there aside from our dumb marshmallow killer. 
If I knew Kevin's drinking habits, he would get blackout drunk in an hour. I didn't need to stay around to be a parent of the group. I listened into the conversations going on. I think the girls had started to talk about how lame YouTube pranks had gotten, or how fake the videos were of people who gave out food and clothing to the homeless. They guessed that the money was either fake, or they took it right back after the video, or the person on the receiving end was a hired actor. I knew Kevin had a thing for Natalie. I should let him do whatever prank he wants to. That way, she would freak out on him, making it clear that he had no chance with her. Maybe he would be too stupid to take even that big of a hint. I don't think he would have anything impressive planned prank-wise. Mostly like jumping out of the dark trying to scare us. I looked around and realized I hadn't heard him creeping around, even though it would have been lots of time for him to do his business and then come back. The lake was dark and as silent as a grave. I didn't go out into nature often, but I assumed it would be a lot louder. I didn't hear any crickets or night creatures, only the sound of water rippling. I was about to look back into the circle of people and into the light of the fire when I heard it. Ribbit. That was no frog. It was someone just saying the word. Clear as day, someone just said ribbit. What on earth was our village idiot doing? Ribbit. I rolled my eyes. Is this really the best you could come up with? Did you guys hear that? Ian asked, looking towards the dark lake following my gaze. It's just Kevin messing around. We know you're out there, I shouted, the last part trying to embarrass him to come out from the dark. A sound came from the lake, like a fish jumping. I squinted, trying to see because it sounded close. Can you see that? Natalie asked. I could see what she meant. Two yellow specks off into the lake. It looked like light reflection animals' eyes did at night. Without any question, those small specks were a set of eyes. At first, I thought our friend had managed a real prank, like he attached some lights to something that floated off in the lake. I watched some documentaries about swamps earlier this year. Those eyes reminded me of how crocodile eyes looked at night. Or maybe they were alligators. All I knew was, I did not like the look of whatever was staring at us in the middle of the lake. Maybe it's like... a duck or something, I offered. Ribbit. The sound came again. Closer this time, as if the set of eyes came up looking at us. I stood up grabbing the flashlight that had rolled to my feet earlier. For some reason, Kevin didn't take it for his bathroom run. More sets of eyes started to show up and everyone was getting a little freaked out. I was getting a little scared even though my rational mind was clinging to the duck idea. I turned on the flashlight to shine the beam out into the lake. When I did, I kept hearing splashing sounds. The dang thing moved too fast. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't catch up with it with the light. I swept it quickly over the dark surface, listening to whatever was in the lake dipping down. Once the flashlight moved away, the eyes came back. I don't like this, Lizzie whispered, and Barb took a hold of her for comfort. I kept the light in one spot, trying to think of what to do. We really should leave. Whatever was going on wasn't best to mess with. But again... Kevin had to ruin everything. We couldn't just leave him behind. He still wasn't back, and I had a choice to make. You all should go. Take Jim with you. I'll keep the light on the lake while you guys leave, then I'll find Kevin. When I get him, I'll drive him back in the town with me. I don't know if we should go to the cops or animal control or what. I don't think any of them wanted to leave, but we were all freaked out to stay. Crap. I just thought of how much everyone had been drinking. I wasn't keeping track of them or who was drunk. I really don't want them driving. Who's sober enough to drive? In a short conversation, we decided Jim and Lizzie could drive. They had only had two beers compared to the four the others had. They would take both their cars and leave mine. The group started to collect their items when the nerve-wracking sound came again. Ribbit. 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 Every single hair on my body stood on end. The voice started to get closer. My hands started to shake. I forced myself steady. 
I was the only one keeping whoever or whatever in the lake. Just go, get the stuff later, I hissed at everyone. They all looked reluctant to leave all their gear behind. Because the plan was to stay the weekend, they had tents and other gear set up at our little site. I would imagine all their gear cost a bit of money. For broke college students, it would be a big blow. I was about to tell them to start going faster, when a sudden burst of movement right outside our firelight made everyone scream and dart into action. I thought I saw a dark human figure creep close to the light's edge. It tossed up sand at the fire, causing everyone to bolt. Most ran for a car, some scrambled trying to get their shoes or pick up their phones. I frantically shot a beam of light around, trying to see what the hell had just come up close, only to find nothing aside from footprints in the sand. We're leaving. I ran, grabbing Cody by the arm. He was the last near the fire. I half dragged him away, chasing after the group. They ran, most screaming to where they parked. In my haste and poor flashlight control, I swung it over wildly. From time to time, I could have sworn I saw a human figure as dark as night in the beam for a half a second. They darted off before my mind could even register what I saw. Behind us, something was tossing sand and water on the fire trying to put it out. All the while we heard a ribbit sound. It wasn't part of that group. I would have found the whole thing funny. I mean, why just say ribbit? Did whatever they think they could fool us with that? Or maybe they just wanted to say it. I made sure everyone was inside the cars and my keys inside my pocket and turned around to face the dark lakeside. I really should have just left Kevin behind. I wasn't thinking straight at the moment. Glimmering on the lake was at least a hundred sets of those horrible eyes. When I saw some off in the darkness, not at all in the lake, I nearly lost all courage to stay. Swallowing down my fear, I would at least make some sort of attempt to find my friend. I took off into a mad dash as the cars peeled away behind me. I ran towards the woods, not wanting to be near the lake's edge. I didn't want to go running into the woods with only a flashlight though. I knew I would get lost. I could only check the open areas, then go back to my car if I found Kevin or not. Hopefully the cops would just take us seriously about someone missing and bring someone who actually knows what the hell they're doing to find him. In my panic, I thought every tree branch or brush that had touched me was a set of hands ready to drag me into the lake. I still heard those ribbit sounds, but fainter as I ran towards the start of the woods. I scanned them with my flashlight, just praying I would find him and get the hell out of there. I had to stop after running so hard. Running on sand was tougher than I thought. My legs burned and my lungs felt like they were going to burst from fear and from dashing about. As I stood, trying to get my second wind, a sound came from close by, something between the faded ribbits coming from the lake. It took everything in me to slowly turn my beam over to where the noise came from. My stomach twisted and turned at the strange sight. Someone was standing in the dark beside a lump that looked like a full trash bag. No, that wasn't right at all. It looked like a trash bag at first, much like how a stack of clothing could look like a person at night. As I stared, the form turned into something else, something human-looking hunched over, back facing towards me. Its skin was dark and oily, making me think I had seen a trash bag at first. My eyes darted to the small person that stood next to it. They weren't Kevin, that's for sure. Maybe a kid looking around 14 with odd blonde hair so light it looked white in the dim light. Even with the flashlight on them, neither looked over at me. I stood frozen in horror, listening to the awful wet crunching sounds that alerted me to these two in the first place. The thing hunched over suddenly seemed to notice me. It froze, then slowly started to turn its head to peer over its shoulder. As it turned its body, I saw a face of sunken features and wild yellow eyes. In its hand was an arm, a half-chewed part arm. I knew what that sound had been, and I was nearly sick. Then the boy looked at me, red eyes staring at me. I couldn't take it. Somehow seeing those glowing eyes looking down right into my soul scared me more than anything else that night. I knew I was not going to find my friend, and I ran like a coward. They never found him. 
Even after we somehow got the cops and some volunteer forest rangers to search for Kevin, he was never found. At first, they thought he was drunk and drowned in the lake. Barb and Cody told the cops about the eyes and the rivets in the lake. The rest of us didn't want to admit to it. So, it was the thought that those two were just drunk also. The friend group broke apart after speaking with the cops. Even Jim wouldn't talk to me, which is hard considering we share a very small room. I never told them what I saw. I didn't think anyone would believe me. And <laughs> What would I tell them? Kevin might have been eaten by some riveting lake monster while a creepy kid watched? No, not a soul would buy that. I just have to keep it to myself and hope his family recovers from their loss. Nature is scary. Things do go bump in the night are all too happy to gobble you up. If ever you're going on a trip and you think it's safe enough, please be careful out there. If something feels wrong, just leave. A chance of a good time isn't worth your life or the life of your friends.